Well, hello, people, folks, ladies, gents, uh, whatever. I'm not going to assume. You know what you are. Welcome to another episode of the Buddy Cast. Uh, sitting across the table from me, in regular fashion, has already removed his shirt. Um, is in nothing but a wife beater, Mr. Aaron Chase. Aaron Chase, how are you? I'm chilling. He's chilling, chilling. It is cold. It is chilly today on this fine afternoon, almost afternoon. Um, we have our guest today, Mr. Danny Frank himself. Danny Frank of the uh, Long Beach Laugh-In, probably my favorite spot that I've done comedy so far, just in terms oh, of aesthetic you, and everything. That's fucking cool. Like, I always imagine a, a comedy club to just be in the middle of like a parking lot and people just go there for cool shit. So that was fun. Thank you for having us there. Oh, dude, my pleasure. And I hope uh, when it comes back uh, to have you back again. Uh, I don't know when that will be, honestly, but we'll see. Uh, If anybody's got a rooftop, literally, that I could borrow, maybe hit me up via DM. Um, I got some ideas, though. I got a couple ideas. You you gave me some ideas with the power inverter. Yeah. Converter, I should say, and all that. You were saying before we started that you were happier because you lost your job? Dude, yeah. I'm it's to- terrible <laughs> to say. Um, but, like, it has been a point in my life where I feel like a positivity breakthrough, which is weird to say. But, like, um, I feel like my job was, like, really weighing me down. It was getting really involved and harder and harder. And What did you do for work? Uh, I'm a nurse That's by right. trade. But uh, for a while, I was a nurse case manager for, like, three years. So kind of like a medical social worker if that makes sense. And Mm. like I worked a lot with people that had workers' comp injuries. Uh, But it basically what it boiled down to was like a boring corporate office job. Um, And that's what it it became over time, you know? And that's just not been my style ever. Uh, Like I was once a graphic design intern at like a small government agency and like that could have been cool. But, like, I didn't want to dress in, like, a tie all the time. And, like, it's, in retrospect, pretty small compromise. But, like, for whatever reason, just wasn't about it. So, and, like, I realize now um, maybe that's just not what the environment that I thrive in. I'm sorry. You no, cut you off. So now that you're not working, you, it just, you can breathe now? Is that what it is? Basically, yeah. Because, like, I feel like my job was getting, like, uh, the amount of difficulty and time that my job would take just kept compounding um and like there was it was becoming regular for me to do like 12 hour days and have to like put in so much time off the clock even though we weren't really we were encouraged not to take overtime but it's like dude you know what you're giving us and then why are you sending out these emails talking about like us being able to access the system over the weekend if you don't expect us to be working and then just like i realized no matter what i was doing uh it just felt like i was running uphill and this wasn't the job that i signed up for you know like i got into nursing initially i think because at the core you're filipino yeah got it because i'm filipino (laughs) no (laughs) no but i love filipino people and the food if anybody's got ponset hook it up george but don't look at me i don't (laughs) know how to cook filipino food Uh Uh, i'm a jungle baby yeah but like not that far yeah no i hear you i didn't know where to get it luckily (laughs) um but yeah no so the reason I became a nurse, I think, initially was because I wanted to help people and it was somewhat idealistic. And then this job was just so de- demanding and corporate and cold and not didn't necessarily feel like we had the patient's best interest in mind all the time so much as we were work- working against metrics. And like I just hated like being talked down to constantly by like a middle management figure and just like didn't feel like my opinions mattered. Um more and more too like i feel like in my mind i was getting to this point where i was like because of comedy honestly because of the phase of my life that has become comedy that i don't think i'm ever going to leave um you know i've got to really know myself and my values and what i like and what i enjoy in life you're never going to leave comedy i can't imagine it now um it's just who i am now that's a you know good I mean? segue <laughs> for my question here yeah what's the plan for comedy you got like a five-year plan Five-year plan? Uh, dude, I'm just going to keep getting, hopefully, better working <laughs> on getting... That's such a positive way to look at that immediately. I, mean, I thought, for me, I'm going to try to not suck. 
Like yeah. I'm such from the bottom. <laughs> I hate saying like I'm a. I feel like I have a really optimistic outlook lately because, um, like, I feel free finally. And, like, y- even leading up to the layoff, I was thinking about just calling my boss, farting into the phone, and, like, swearing off working for somebody <laughs> ever again. You know what I mean? Very Terrence and Philip quit. Like, I feel like I was getting to that office space uh, moment in my life, and this was kind of a weird blessing. And it's given me a little bit of room to breathe, and luckily I got unemployment. And with comedy, hopefully I can double down a little more. Um, like, I've been slowly building my own little studio at home to do whatever I want in. And been working on some little secret projects in the background that I hope to unveil. And hopefully they become good. Mostly just tinkering, though. But I really got to, in a very safe and socially distant way, get out there and start practicing in front of people again. Yeah. That's the most important part of comedy, and it's going to be interesting navigating, finding a safe way to do it, but, like, I realize that we have to adapt. Once... I'm sorry. No, I was just saying it doesn't seem like it's going away right away. Once um, once you are able to to perform again and do all that stuff, what's going to be the strategy for getting better? The obvious answer to that is just keep performing, but, like, do you have a... a do you have anything you're working on or in terms of skill or I mean I'm always me and George were talking about this too like I think as a comedian if you're trying to be a good comedian you're always trying to understand the mechanics of what it is we're doing and the fundamentals and refine like your ideas of like what that is I Based agree I, I think we sh- we're supposed to be doing that I'm not right but <laughs> I'm trying to dude like I've actually been reading through like random books about like joke writing I've been trying to like learn how to do other things like learn about screenwriting because I feel like that's going to help me understand writing tighter dialogue and i.e. monologues yeah comedy's kind of like funny monologues um but yeah I, I mean the short answer and the simple answer is the same thing that like many, many people have told me, and it's no secret. Just keep writing, keep performing. Yeah, That's keep writing for sure. Aaron, you have to see this man's notebook, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, Dude, I want you no. to <laughs> walk him walk him and the listeners through this. It's a rocket book? Yeah, it's We're a not, He's not a shill. Maybe I am. A, dude, you don't have to just give me a free one, but like, this is <laughs> fucking game-changing. This, this notebook thingy? Okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah, explain it. So this notebook, and I feel like such a fucking nerd explaining this notebook, but it is really cool, got to say. It's like a laminated, uh, almost like a three-ring binder, but it's way thinner. All these pages are laminated, essentially. They're made out of this texture that makes it like a white board, almost. You use these friction pens by Pilot on it. When you're done drawing on it, or writing on it, or whatever you're doing on it, and you need to scan and... Uh, categorize and organize it these QR codes and these little icons on the bottom that you can check off combined with the app will automatically save it as a PDF and file it for you so you can link it to your Evernote Google Drive whatever and they're 30 bucks and when you're done with the page you just get some water and this little rag wipes away so you can use this book infinitely. I'm a caveman. <laughs> I know. That's what I learned from this. Yeah. I'm a fucking caveman. We're, we're in the future, bro. I was looking at it, and I was like, oh, dude, there's no paper in it. He must rip his shit That's out a lot. That's what I thought. I was like, yo, this motherfucker been writing. And it's not that he hasn't, but it's like I was just wrong. It's like That has like 12 pages that you can just erase. Jesus. And man. then it scans in and saves it for you. And essentially, you have a notebook that's minimalist. Yeah, it's accessible everywhere, and it keeps all your notes in one place. What? Um, fuck me, dude. That's crazy. What? Right. What is your writing? How? Your writing strategy? Like, how do you write the process? How do I write? Yeah, it's an interesting question, man, because it's a variety of ways, and like I feel like, in a honest, all honestly, um, in order for my material to really develop, it kind of does it through an organic process that involves me using the stage. An audience reaction. So, like, right now, I don't know that I can fully develop anything that I'm writing so without you, that audience. You come up with an idea, you put it on stage without writing, you see how they react, and then you start writing. Uh, sometimes. Mm. 
I used to do that. Sometimes I'll write a bit when it comes to me, uh, usually throughout the day. If anything p funny in my mind pops up, I'll write it down um, or try and organize it. I used to keep like notes in my phone, but if you look at my phone, I have like hundreds of notes that have gone unsorted. Mm -hmm. So I had to find ways to like trick myself into organizing all the thoughts that I have. Um, but it seems to be that's the key is try and catch every idea and just see where they go. I uh, And then write on it and refine it, throw it out there, whatever. You yeah. what? No, I, I, I understand that more now. As of recent, that's kind of, I've adopted more of that in how I write things now. So I, I get where you're coming from there. How do you write things? Um, like, what's your process like? <laughs> it's, Fuck, dude, you just turned this podcast into a two-parter. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, it's changed a lot, but now it is basically walk around and live my life. Don't think about comedy at all. And then when something, I, 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 I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't say funny. I would say interesting. It kind of comes to my brain hole. Then I put that down. Um, I have shit written down. Let's see. But I, I just write that down. Is not funny. And then I sit down and I try to organize it a little bit into a joke. Put that on the street now because there's not yeah. enough open mic. And uh, there's not enough open mics. Uh, put that on the street, work it out from there, and then continue to build on it. it takes right. it to the streets. Yeah. So, like, I have, I just wrote this two nights ago. Sometimes you have to be John Smith. I can explain that if you want me to. Sometimes you have to sometimes rape Pocahontas. Sometimes you got to be the colonizer. That's funny. Yeah. Sometimes you got to embrace your inner white man to, uh, no. Um, so, is it fair to say you jump off of, like, these theses that you collect? Sort of. It used to be I would I was like I would, I'm going to pick a topic or yeah. or an idea. Then I'm going to force myself to write opinions about that and then right. go from there. Now it's a little more organic. But that came from um, an interaction with my girlfriend where she was I don't know I was being me and being center of attention. And then something happened where I was like Oh I'm just going to hang back and let her be Pocahontas essentially. And it's, right. that idea was like sometimes it's good to just. It'll hang back and let the person be the main character of the story for a second. That's an interesting point. Yeah. That it takes a, uh, took me a long time to realize too, is like, you, you're not always in the limelight. It's not always about you for yeah. sure. That's a thing. I think everybody realizes as you mature, probably. Um, um, if you mature. It, right. If you mature. How? That is a very good point. <laughs> how have, Stop how, attacking me, dude. I'm sitting right here. We're both giving him an evil eye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys can't see. We're like, if you mature, George. <laughs> how did you no. end up dealing with things? Like when OG Quarantine started, how did you handle that? Well, like what a great to, rap name. OG, <laughs> OG Quarantine. <laughs> OGQ. People don't fuck with All OG Quarantine. All up in this bitch. <laughs> comes out with 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 uh I keep it locked down <laughs> <laughs> track 19 covid Sorry. infinite punchlines can come from that but yeah. um yeah no kind of like what you were saying and this kind of goes also into my process because uh, you made a very good point and yeah you gotta live your life uh living your life like bettering yourself becoming the best you like i think all that helps in becoming more clear on your perspective on who you are, I guess. And that translates when you're communicating and trying to do comedy. That literally is a, a recent click I've had right, of living like, your fucking life. You gotta live life. Yeah. Otherwise the shit isn't as interesting. And like we're privileged as comedians, hopefully, and just as people that have declared themselves uh, comedians, you know, to live these lives independent, hopefully from outer influence and try to be your most, most authentic self. And uh, do everything that you want to do, you know, because like not everybody, some people are out there living corporate jobs. They can't say what's on their mind. And ideally, we'll get to a point where this is all we do and we can just be free. Yeah, I. Um, it's funny. I don't even and I don't know if you look at this as cocky. I don't even think of it ideally anymore. I just think of it. That's what's going to happen. Like. I say it because I don't want to come off as cocky mm. or arrogant. That must be why I needed to be on your podcast because how people perceived me. <laughs> no. You were on the podcast, dude, because yeah, yeah. I enjoy you as a person. No, thanks. Um, and yeah, but whatever. Now you're good. Quit assuming everybody hates you. I'm uh, sure. 
I've I've given up on if they hate me or not. It is what it is. That's but, how you should live life, right? Yeah. Just be free. Um, but don't worry about things you can't control, like other people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. For me, it's just like no. This is what's going to happen. Yeah, I kind of feel that too, and that's kind of why. And this is not to sound cocky or arrogant either, because um, I know I'm gonna have to work hard once uh, we really hit the ground running and things open up again. But, like, I feel like there's nothing else I want to do but, like, be this version of myself that I'm building that, like, even if we take a break and this lasts for two years, it doesn't matter. I know where I'm going to be when that third year breaks and it opens up. George's face. Huh? Fucking two years, bro. It's been a long year. It has been a very long year, but I'm saying, like, if it took 50 years, I would be there on 51st year ready to fucking rock it hard. And honestly... I doubt we'd all wait that long, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it it takes what it takes. And at this point, this is my, my lifelong journey. So whatever it is, is whatever it's going to take, it's going to take. Did something change in you when COVID started? Uh, I wouldn't say when COVID started. Uh, I feel like I've been gradually maturing and growing. Like I said, over the past couple of years specifically, I feel like I've made a lot of growth personally. And uh, a lot of that has to do with just taking more risks and being more comfortable with myself. Not to say that, like, I don't feel weird and awkward. Um, sometimes, like, somebody invited me, a bigger comedian invited me to, like, her birthday party. And I couldn't stop my body from I fucking I didn't know sweating. you knew Whitney Cummings, bro. No. That's crazy. That's, <laughs> That's crazy. You got, he all. didn't say it, but he showed us a picture. That's Whitney Cummings, dude. <laughs> Bigger to me, uh, <laughs> which is pretty much everybody. Like, Aaron, if you invited me to a party, I'd be like, this bigger comedian. Well, <laughs> if Aaron invited me to a party, yeah. I'd be like, I'm not hanging around in your garage, bro. Like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> anyway, though, like, I didn't need to make a big deal of it in my head, but I couldn't not be. I was like, I showed up and I was sweat. I couldn't not be sweaty, you know, okay. like. Can I ask you a serious question yeah. in a semi-serious form? No. <laughs> Too bad. <If laughs> you, all right. So you're, imagine you as a Charmander. What stage of evolution are you? Oh, my God. Right you're going to fucking hate me so bad. I did not subscribe to cool. Pokemon. This was great podcast. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, I got it. There's, a, there's another example that's not Pokemon, but I know what I think I know what you're getting at. Like which generation of myself am I? Yeah, assuming third is your final, one, two, okay. or three. I'm in like top second. Okay, the top cool. The last era of the uh, second level or stage of evolution, I guess. So a uh, Charmeleon that is not as much of an asshole. A Charme? No, 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 no. If we're going Ashes Charmander, it's going to be a Charmeleon with a big ass flame on his tail. Have mm. I been an asshole? No, no. I mean, in oh, reference, like, in oh, comparison okay. to the the. The Pokemon he's talking about in particular is an asshole. Okay. Um, not you specifically. No. I, I would not describe you ever as being acting like an asshole. No. No, not at all. I think I've always thought I was an asshole. But Why? I think, um, well, I've definitely been an asshole before. But I think I've tripped out for a majority of my life too much on what other people think. What? Recently, I feel more free from that. Well, that's good. Why did you think you were an asshole? Because I've never really viewed you as such. Um, I've definitely been a dick to people. I think you know, he was like, the one that knocked you out. <laughs> <laughs> it was you the whole time. He's like, I just had to get it out. <laughs> KJ, why didn't you yeah. let me know it was Danny Frank? Because KJ helped him. He's like, That's look, we're gonna, is. we're right here, bro. Just come out. <laughs> Some three D chess right there. <laughs> Motherfucker yelled out OG quarantine. I don't know what that means. No. Um. Yeah, I'm sorry. What was the question? Um, I have brain damage from getting assaulted by you, so I don't remember. No, uh, <laughs> the the question was, why did you why did you perceive yourself? Oh, right. Why did I think I was an asshole? Um, you know what, dude? Also, too, I feel like I was I was coming out of a relationship when I first got into comedy where I was gaslit a lot and told I was an asshole. And looking back on it, I was certainly immature and uh, could have been better as a boyfriend i guess you can look back on any relationship that didn't work out on spot your flaws i'm sure i'm the superhero you know, I know but you're talking about. <laughs> yeah um i don't even know why i looked at you when i said that either. <laughs> that's also a weird thing to notice but uh yeah so i think a lot of those feelings were pent up feelings that i harbored because of that and that stuck and it was hard for me to shed hmm. for a long time and then also having to be like take on different authoritarian roles um 
this didn't even have to be authoritarian, but admittedly, there, I've been a supervisor sometimes, uh, especially when I was like dealing with like traumatic brain injuries and stuff, where it was like literally life and death. And, like, I would act as such. And I think it took me a long time to relax and not be in that headspace. Where, like, not ev- not no one's going to die if, like, things don't go the way that it's planned. And, like, bringing that into, like, production, uh, whenever the comedy shows do go back up again, I always think about that. Like, if things all go away and everything goes wrong, like, at least nobody's dying. Like, this is still light years better than what I used to do. Not to say that I regret doing any of that, um, but I look back and I was definitely wound up for a long time, I think, because I was exposed, especially in nursing, to like all these crazy circumstances. Like I've met a lot of outliers in my life, good or bad. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. George just <laughs> blew me away from the moment I met him. Uh, George is a gunslinger. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That would be a dope job. Gunslinger? Uh, yeah, fuck. Does being a cop? No, but I'm talking like meet me in the square at noon. Let's let's see who could take their fucking gun out the fastest. Cause like that, <laughs> that's how samurai fought. Did you know that? I it, didn't know. It was never like a big like lightsaber duel. Like a katana is designed to be pulled out, sliced simultaneously, and then put away. That reminds me of uh, what is it, Rokimbo? Rokimbo. There's a movie that Rokimbo. Uh, no, Rokimbo. <laughs> There's a movie that uh, was definitely the direct inspiration for the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it was a samurai movie, and cool. it's like shot for shot, the exact same western. George, have you ever fucked with samurai swords before? No, I want to. Mm, I can see you. It looks with hard. Oh yeah, for I sure. I can see you doing that. That's yeah. I would probably go like autistic focus like onto it. That's, that's all I would do the whole day. Have you done any weapons training? I had gun. Mm. <laughs> Does that count? I mean, uh, <laughs> not, yeah, I wouldn't right. call it. Is gunplay martial arts it was different? <laughs> John Wick, yeah. But yeah, for John oh, Wick, holy a whole shit, other, dude. Yeah, that's a whole other <laughs> level. Um, do you plan on moving out of state? Yeah, or in know, in, in general, I guess. I'm open to it. Uh, Where do you live right now? Right now, I live in Corona. Mm. What number? What, what street? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> For everybody out there, write this down. Right. <laughs> Top floor or first floor? First floor, <laughs> no. Uh, On Sunset 201. I wouldn't rule it out. It's kind of a weird thing, man. Uh, I feel like lately I'm trying to set my life up so that I'm in a position where I can be mobile mm-hmm. and maybe even live out where would you go? Top for a while. I love Washington. love Seattle. got to say, um, as soon as I got laid off, I used some of the severance money that I got and like, I had always wanted to like go up there with somebody because um, I've been going up there for a long time. Used to have other friends that lived up there that have all kind of moved out of that area, but technically I have family up there too. But every time I've gone up there, it's pretty much been a solo mish uh, with the exception of like one time with f- another friend and another time uh, to be in a buddy's wedding. And I just love that area. Uh, the sense of community in that city is crazy. Crazy time right now to witness because uh, there's so much anti-police sentiment in the air, and it's very, very apparent um, throughout that city. Like, I, it was kind of cool to w- bring my mom to the city that I love and show somebody you know that it would have never otherwise gone because she doesn't really do anything and has never really done anything, never really left the state or anything, had no desire to. So I wanted her to experience like life outside of her bubble. So I brought her to this place, and we're driving to this street to go to Dick's Hamburgers, get some food. It's like 10 at night, and we see like 40 people in all black marching down the street, yelling out the names of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, um, yelling out, all cops are bastards, and they're being slowly followed by about two blacked out, what I assume are cruisers, like they look like cop cars. Didn't have any identifying marks on them. It's like an undercover cop. It's like, dude, yeah. we can all tell you're a cop. Stop yeah. it. <laughs> no, I mean, it's very apparent. Stop asking me where to buy weed. Yeah. And then there's like 40 people on, 40 bike cops over there, also there. And I believe we, um, like that group later on that night got arrested after some some sort of violence broke out. That doesn't seem but to be the spot. Seattle? 
Yeah, from what I'm seeing, it was not that. Not for you. Not for you. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> no, you'd like it, I think. Would I? I, I don't it's know. too much sadness for him. He yeah. needs sunshine. He's like a he's like a sunflower. I he can needs see to that, see that, but I can see, see the world. In love with it too, dude. It's a very beautiful place. I, Outside of these stories, I'm saying, because I, I will say this too. Like the biggest thing that I found funny was that my mom kept remarking about how she found it so funny and uh, kind of charming that when they looked when she made eye contact with like the Antifa members, they just shot her back peace signs. And she's like, I kind of understand why they feel the way they feel. I was like, that's very progressive. What's go- what's going on in the culture up there that's having, because they're Portland's or that is it Portland. Portland. Yeah. Is the other crazy liberal, that area, extreme area, that area relative to the rest of the country feels like it's on a whole other level it right does. now. It what's, feels like they're going through their own like insurgency. What's going on? Why why does that happen? Up there? I mean, I don't want to talk on behalf of it because I don't represent it. Mm. But um, from what I gather, uh, and I'll say this too, and I've said this on other podcasts, I don't believe all cops are bastards and that all police are bad. Uh, I believe there's definitely issues of accountability that need to be fixed, though. Um, but these people, for the most part, Man, I was watching this documentary about anti. What what is Antifa? Uh, anti fascism. Well, yeah, no, I'm saying oh, that that oh, was oh, the yeah. topic of the documentary, and right. it was what is Antifa. And when you think about it, anybody that opposes like a fascist dictator, totalitarian, authoritarian government, uh, i.e., you, me, George, like we're all Antifa by the definition of it. We're anti fascist, right? You know, um, but this catch all term has been applied to like these random groups of people that don't necessarily represent the same cause. Because I've noticed in watching like these live streams of like the Seattle protests that a lot of these, I guess, a lot of these protesters are there on behalf of Black Lives Matter as a concept. That, okay. I'll, I'll speak, I'll speak my opinion about that in a second. Yeah. <laughs> Not as an organization. Yeah. Some are there as, support for black lives matter as an organization Mm -hmm. a lot are there as a there uh it's protest police brutality in general in seattle and a lot are anti-systemic racism through the policing system Mm -hmm. and there's a smaller percentage but it is the loudest minority that is the black bloc party and that is like the anarchists that believe that the only way to solve this issue is by completely destroying and dismantling the old system through any means necessary. Like, whereas like, you know, Martin Luther King million man March, that was explicitly nonviolent. These people believe that the nonviolence is not enough. Mm -hmm. And these are the people breaking windows and destroying private property and getting the entire protest shut down and arrested. Um, Like the other night I watched hundreds of people, get arrested on live stream in Minneapolis. Um, The police were very calm and polite and deliberate about it. And they slowly processed hundreds of people, including families and like paramedics and stuff like that. And um, processed. Sounds like 1984. It does. But I know exactly what you're talking about, you know, like. Yeah. (laughs) But also, too, it's like it's that catch 22 because it just takes one fucking person that goes and destroys a bunch of private property and they've now created a blemish on the entire movement or whoever's there. And I'm sorry, you, you wanted to talk about it, BLM. That, that, that is just an annoying, frustrating thing. Yeah. There's really not, not much else that can be said other than like, yeah. it's, it is, it's just frustrating. Yeah, now I understand. I can only imagine how it feels to you. Um, we've talked ad nauseum <laughs> for the, about this. Yep. Um, uh, to, to switch it back to comedy. Yeah. What do you predict is the future of it? So, like, to add some context to this, it feels like we had a comedy bubble yeah. that was being built, and then it popped. So where do you think things are going now? Uh, and just before we get off it, Seattle's a beautiful place outside the politics. I, I encourage it. everybody to check it out. They have trees and shit, place. right? And coffee. Trees, coffee, rain. Grey's Anatomy. W- Jimi Hendrix was born there. A lot of music culture. Mm-hmm. A lot of record stores. Um, very cool place. But yeah, going back to the future of comedy, it's crazy. Uh, I don't know. For the first time, I don't know. Rooftops, if anybody's got one. Feels like we all got knocked down. Everyone got knocked down a peg except for famous 
comedians. No, it was cool with listening to Bill Burr talk about like he had to go to secret mics and do it in yeah. fucking parking lots and shit. It's like, oh, we're all having the same experience again. So yeah. it it was cool in that sense of like all you had left was your talent and figure out how to do it now. And he still did. <laughs> he still had a great set. And then I'll admit too, man, I'm kind of like kicking myself for not being more gung ho about getting out there when I see some people are. But at the same time, like it's a weird time. Nobody knows for certain anything. So it's like and you're it's out there feeling guilty too, don't. It's hard to find situations or avenues to even perform. So Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like I can show you there's definitely an underground scene going down throughout uh California. Where? Uh, allegedly. It's allegedly. Allegedly. Right, enough, allegedly. Yeah. Different <laughs> counties. Uh, yeah, teach me the secret knock. I don't even know how, like, some, some people added me to, like, these group messages, and then occasionally I'll get invited to stuff. And I'm like, that seems sketchy, but hmm. what else That's is what it's on? like to have but friends. Group not messages. really, man. Fuck. Not even. <laughs> uh, not even. I don't feel. I had to put my mom in a group message so she talked to me. <laughs> When do you think you'll be able to start doing comedy? When was the last time you were on stage? <sighs> Fucking March, dude. Okay. I feel bad about that. Why do you feel bad? Do my I last like I mic been doing it was a riff off. Time, but at the same time, too, it's like, who knows? Maybe I would have died. Probably not, but who knows? <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, that's what it comes back to, right? Is it, I could have died really at the beginning. It, I guess. <laughs> my not. jokes aren't that good. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking now, too. I've, I've realized so much of what I thought was good was not. Of your material? And yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, a lot of my material just doesn't represent the same perspective that I think I currently have, too. So I can feel like this is going to be a good time when we go back to start crafting this new stuff. Are you burning? So you've, you've burnt all of it now? You're just going to start fresh? I don't know. I haven't really made that decision. But also, too, I don't. <laughs> Good or bad, I'm not putting a lot of pressure on myself lately. Because, mm -hmm. again, like I feel like I'll figure it out when I do, um, when I need to. And lately, I'm just in this point of resetting everything. What do you think you're going to talk about? I don't know, man. There's a lot of stuff on my mind. It's hard to stray away from politics and like race and stuff like that because, uh, believe it or not, that affects me too. Um, but I don't know if I'm that good yet. Uh, I don't know if I want to put myself in any boxes. You know, I noticed that a lot of looking back, a lot of my jokes are kind of silly. How so? Uh, just like absurd stuff. Like, uh, I have a joke about, I don't think you've ever heard it. Um, but like I had a joke about like how I used to do home health nursing. It was kind of like being a pizza delivery boy and you go to different homes. And I went to this one home where this guy was always talking about and he couldn't tell uh, that I was Mexican, I think he thought I was Italian, but he got a little too comfortable with his races, and he'd always talk about his World War II collection, World War II this, World War II that. Like you got to see it one day, and I didn't really know what it meant, but one day I checked it out. You know, who made a lot of World War II memorabilia that I forgot about, the Nazis. And as I stood there holding his polished Nazi helmet, oh, I, I wished him a DiGiorno, and I got the fuck out of there. That sounds expensive. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was the, weird though, because like I, that comes from real life. There was a dude I met in Lake Forest that like collects Nazi shit, and like, you feel like that is silly material. Uh, I, at the end where I wish him a DiGiorno and I get the fuck out of there a little bit. Well, that's a punchline. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's comedy. I get it. Exactly. Well, like, something they did not see coming. Sorry, yeah. I was sitting on it. I had to get it out. It's okay. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, some of that's silly. I, I don't know. I'm always hard on myself, man. I'm learning to not be so hard on myself. So you think... But... No, sorry. No, I was just going to say, but uh, I feel like there's a better version of myself out there yet to be discovered. So you think that your comedy in the future when you start up again is going to be more, for lack of a better word, serious? Uh, I don't know. Again, I don't know where it's going to lead, man, because I'm not mm -hmm. trying to put too much pressure on myself or like put myself in the bubble. And I know this is annoying because I'm not committing... To hmm. anything, um, all I can say is like whenever I do start up again, I know that I'm going to keep doing it um, as hard and passionately as I do anything. I uh, tend to do everything with a lot of effort because like, I take things too seriously. 
I have a new favorite question. Yeah. What's it? What is your favorite and least favorite part of your style? Oh, dude, do I have style? Am I funny? I don't know. Jury's still out. Um, like, I don't think I'm even good enough to comment on this to necessarily, to be honest. How would you describe your style? Like, if you had a, um, if you had a Netflix special yeah. and, and it would be like, Danny Frank is such and such thing, how would you describe it? I mean, irreverent, maybe. But, okay. Uh, in that, like, I don't have any topics that I are have too to Google that word. Irreverent. Holding no reverence for something. Holding no importance. You can't use the word in the description. Well, I'm saying, mm. like, so to revere something, right, like, is, like, to encourage, to enjoy, like, all that. So if you're, if it's irreverent, I'm saying that basically I hold nothing sacred. Um, and I'd like to get to a point where I can talk about anything, you know, Um but you look at a lack like, of respect for people or things that are generally taken seriously. Yeah. Okay. Irreverent. Irreverent. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sorry. stupid. Sorry. Um, I went to public no, school just, and shit. Dude, My me too. college ends in CC. <laughs> I dropped out. So you got me, man. Um, I mean, you know like, the, like how if I were to describe Burt Kreischer, it would yeah. be like party animal, takes off his shirt, as silly, as wild, as. Um, as drinks and, and and whatnot like how would you describe your style i guess awkward serious guy um that's a great special title i don't know dude no no punctuation awkward, awkward serious, serious guy, guy. Yeah. <laughs> come on fuck i better come up with a special i can steal All right, it. i'll write it down hold on <laughs> <laughs> no now you're flexing on me with that goddamn book <laughs> that's so cool fucking a all right this is the I know it might seem like an unrelated question, yeah. but it's not. Like, what did you want to be when you were a kid? Like, when you're like, you wanted to grow up? Because early on for me, it was astronaut, Air Force pilot, paleontologist, and that was like he- most, and the ninja. But that's still, that's that never goes away. Do you want to hear like all of them? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because I was definitely one of those kids where like, I remember watching the movie Face Off, and then like coming out and like wanted to be John Travolta. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I was very impressionable. Um. But I'm like on tape and on record, and I've got like old letters and stuff. Um, okay, Hamilton. <laughs> I know it's creepy to say, but like I've found like a lot of letters and shit that I wrote when I was a kid, and uh, it's crazy how much better my handwriting was for some reason. But um, probably because you did it more, really realistically, I guess you know, so. every I don't day. Know. Now did you ever have like those teachers that made you rewrite shit just to retain it? You know what I used to do is uh, there was a couple times I got in trouble and I would have to copy pages out of the dictionary, and I, that's cruel and unusual punishment. That's fucked yeah. up. Man. Do you have contact lenses now? Because you could probably sue them for that. No, I do. yeah, <laughs> Damn no, right. yeah. Uh, I do wear glasses occasionally though. Um, but no. Uh, wait, what was the original question? Uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Right. Uh, sorry, stuntman was real one of deep them. question. I know. Right? <laughs> baffled me with the complexity of it mm-hmm. but no i remember wanting to be a stuntman uh for a long time and that encouraged me to like do weird extreme sports when i was younger nice and then uh the other big thing was i wanted to be an animator or cartoonist and i actually have this creepy note that i wrote when i was like seven i want to say that says like i want to be like a world famous cartoonist and i want to get paid to like have my own studio and have a holiday named after me for some reason holiday yeah i feel like that's not the way to go ambitions a la columbus day right (laughs) (laughs) what type of cartoons inspired you uh dude honestly when i the best cartoons that i remember growing up with and i still watch them occasionally on youtube uh late night Comedy Central cartoons like Duckman, The Critic. Um, I loved home movies, uh, Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Uh, sp- there's a ton. Uh, irreverent. <laughs> irreverent. They're irreverent. They're They're irreverent. They're irreverent cartoons. Yeah, a little bit. So like um, adult, adult stuff. Definitely, and like Creature Comforts. If you guys ever saw uh, Wallace and Gromit. So the guy that made Wallace and Gromit made Creature Comforts long before that, and that was a really awesome thing you can catch on YouTube. No, for Gromit, free. the moon's not made of cheese. Yeah. <laughs> well, so it's like a it's a whole series of man on the street style interviews with these zoo animals, um, but they're all English, and they have very complex, strangely serious uh, 
and advanced ideas about like society and they're just a collection of interviews of people on the street that they put to these claymation stop motion uh, animation with all these animals those things uh, definitely inspired me the critic definitely inspired me that was an awesome awesome show what's a cartoon you guys think is overrated Ooh, now, family guy oh. it became overrated it was good in the first couple of seasons mm. to me but then yeah like I I got tired of the joke writing. Mm, I can and see that. The, like, I see it coming. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I feel like South Park definitely ruined it by exposing the joke structure to <laughs> me. Um, That's why I don't watch comedy. I don't want to see how the sausage is made. I dude, just I like used enjoying to, the sausage. I used to love South Park, by the way, too. Uh, I remember my mom had no idea what the fuck South Park was. And I still have VHS copies of like every episode. And like... Remember, her boss used to give me South Park merchandise because she felt it was funny that I mm-hmm. also watched South Park. And then, like later on, my mom watched the show and she's like, "Oh my god, I had no fucking idea." It's letting you watch this, like, oh, and of course, above all, The Simpsons. Do you guys like The Simpsons? Never really watched. Yeah, it wasn't on me. Really? Yeah. Is that underrated or overrated? Dude, the first like ten seasons, specifically like the first seven or eight are the best uh brilliant show still holds up still holds up nice. uh, a lot of literary references film references really good storylines really well written a lot of famous uh well not a lot but like conan was the executive producer dana gould was the executive producer and writer um really really good mm. i would encourage watching the first like seven seasons if you can what about you george overrated mm-hmm. rick and morty I'm listening. It was just, I don't know. It felt like I, I, I understand what's going on. I get it, but it wasn't. But is that the show, or is that blowing. the is that the fan rabid fan base that makes? I think they have to come hand in hand. And t- if if it's if we're talking about something being overrated, then you can't ignore the audience. Like their reaction to it did not meet in terms, in my opinion, the expectations that I had for the show because so, I came in after it was done already. Yeah. After I had seen the reactions, like, I get it. I, I could see why you guys would be obsessed with it, but I think you took it a little far. So That's fair. But I did have to watch it like three times, and then the third time was when I was like, oh, I get it, I get it, I get it. <laughs> so I'm stupid. Um, I have a question that I'll give you context for. It. Yeah. What's a style of comedy that you dislike? And before I, you answer that, yeah. I was thinking... I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was thinking about when we were talking about it with Adrian Lopez, I, I think. The comedians that don't want it to be funny. How, George, how did you word it? I don't know. Like anti This is your question, bro. The, no, the, the... Like Andy Kaufman style stuff, or what do you mean? No. Oh, fuck. I don't know how to word it. All right. <laughs> I just remember George bringing it up, and I can't remember how you worded it, but you worded it really well that... The the type of com I think alt is it alt comedy or is it is that different? What do you what does alt comedy mean to you? Uh, fuck man, I don't know. It's a, like a comedian who is is like it's more about expressing a thought than a joke, something like that. Like old school David Cross style, or like give me an example of what that would be. He's an interesting like. All right, yeah. What do you think about that kind of con- like David Cross? I'll be honest, like alt comedy is what brought me in uh, to comedy. I think David Cross was the first comedian I ever saw. And that was live like, or, or just like in general? Live. Cool. Where? I was like 16, and my friend's uh, sister was going to Chapman University Law, and they snuck me in to the auditorium. They didn't check IDs or anything. They're just like, come on. It, well, it's just like one person in charge of this hall. <laughs> you know, like everybody come in. Um, but it was dope, dude. And I remember H. John Benjamin played the voice of God for some reason in that show. And, uh, I loved it. It was, he was full of piss and vinegar and it wasn't necessarily joke structure. It was just a lot of opinions, um, and storytelling. And I fucking loved it. Um, which I know doesn't help the question. What do I dislike? Uh, cause I, honestly, dude, it's kind of hard for me to think, do I dislike anything? I dislike bad comedy, but I mean, 
if you're trying something, I guess I'll watch it. Yeah, it does boil down down to that, right? Is, if that person funny? thinks that's comedy, it's it's almost not even up to us at that point whether yeah. it's good or bad. To, I hate that about life. The bigger question <laughs> though is like, is it funny, right? But like, again, if, it could be to them. I'll tell you what, like, all right, what kind of uh, doesn't annoy me, but I don't understand it is uh, Ghost Train. What is Ghost Train? Ghost Train? Ghost Train. The uh, guy that dresses in Western gear and a Predator mask. Oh, I thought and that was Go. Uh, I didn't know that was his name. I thought it was like something else with Bob or Billy. Maybe it's changed it. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about, though. The guy uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. at the Ontario Improv occasionally. Yeah. He has like a Predator mask and he eats an, a fake ass at some point. I remember that guy. You yeah. remember that guy? Wow. Yeah, how do you forget that? <laughs> what? What? What have you had? Have you ever like had a conversation with him? No. Same. Have you? He doesn't stick around. Honestly, it creeps me out that he wears gloves, like Paul Bear gloves. And I'm just like, I don't want to know anything else. It's a about wink. You. He's like, I've been telling you the yeah. whole time. <laughs> I have bodies. Yeah. It makes me wonder why. Like, what's going on? I mean, fuck. Maybe we should get him for a buddy cast. But like, yeah. Why? He, there's definitely a very intentional concept there. Uh, whether or not we realize what it is, like. He's doing it very deliberately, whatever it is he's doing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I guess I dislike bad comedy or comedy that I don't think is funny or don't quite get. Um, as far as alt comedy, though, I kind of feel like alt comedy is kind of like where we're at again because I think when alt comedy came around in L.A., the first club I ever went to, too, I think was like a Largo in L.A., and that was like a big hub for alt comedy where it first started. But that all started, I think, out of uh, comedians in the 90s trying to do, like, alternative spaces, which is kind of, like, back where we're at, right? That makes um, sense. And that's kind of what gave me the idea to seek out, like, alternative locations, too. Like, at one point, the Long Beach Laughing was behind, like, an antique, not even an antique store. It's, like, a vintage special specialty store that also had, like, a leather maker in Jeez. it for some reason. They sold plants. And it was a coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best part of your life right now? Dude, uh, I just feel very good about my mindset, honestly. It's cheesy, but like I've been in a very good place. Like I said, I feel very free. Uh, I asked a girl out in the most adult way, and I got the most adult yes. You but up? it was a yes. Yeah. What, wait, wait, yeah, what are like, you doing? Yeah, how, <laughs> right. No, how'd how'd um, you spit game, sir? How did you go about that? Just being direct and... Just like I successfully got out of the friend zone, which is crazy to say. Nice. Um, Are you guys dating? No. Okay. Uh, I don't want to put labels or anything. Um, it's hey, just, you out there trying to fuck? I got, I, I, got the, <laughs> I got the positive recognition that I need. That's all that matters. Um, and I felt very positive about it. I feel like I've grown as a person where I'm very, I don't have a lot of fear these days. Well, that's good. Yeah, it's weird. Um, whatever's going to happen is going to happen, and I'm going to do my best. And So, pr dice roll. prior to this change or this shift, that's not how you would have approached a woman? Was that that level of directness? I think through most of my life, without realizing it, I've been afraid of things and just living in fear, out of fear of rejection, failure, sometimes success. Um, but, like, I've realize like i've held myself back uh tremendously and i think we all do without realizing it just through not taking chances um because like i mean how many things have you done in your life so far that like you could have never foreseen going correctly and it did and the biggest thing the biggest catalyst is just taking that chance you know like you wouldn't be here if you didn't go up on stage and just rip it and you wouldn't keep doing it if you didn't keep coming back no matter what the outcome was, you know? And like every day I try to, I guess, identify things that are making me f frightened when it happens and then just work around it but um, and see if it's warranted 90% of the time it isn't. What do you think instilled that anxiety initially? Oh, dude, I've had like anxiety and depression my whole life. So it's like... Uh, you think it's like a medical thing or do you think it's an environmental thing? Both. Um, both for sure. Like my dad... Good or bad, uh, schizophrenic, d as bipolar, uh, mania. Bad things. He's bad things, yeah. Not so good men mental things. 
a lot of things like that on his side of the family, unfortunately. And uh, I'm sure I've got a little bit of that. Thankfully, I'm not full-blown schizophrenic yet. Um, but even if I was, is that a bad thing? Um, uh, uh, I don't think <laughs> it is, right? But, like, it's a very complex question. Yeah, actually, I want to dig into that a little now. Yeah. Is schizophrenia a bad thing? I don't think it is. What where I could, maybe we would have to define what is bad and good then, because yeah. from from what I understand, Star Wars talk. I love it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> from what I understand of schizophrenia, I, I would. I'm so unqualified to talk on this. <laughs> I mean, so are we? But it's a podcast, and no yeah. one gives a shit. And I'm wearing a wife beater and pajamas. I just so. want to say I may be a nurse, but I'm no not an expert on right. anything. From what I under- kind of dumb. <laughs> from what I understand of it, I would describe it as. Yeah bad because it is um seems to be messing with your perception of reality yeah i mean it's definitely bad in that it's like uh definitely a disability Mm. um but like does that give people like should those people not be given the same amount of recognition and respect for doing the same deeds that other people do you know like I used to think, I think when I was younger, uh, I was frightened to one day, like grow up and realize like I'm not like that. I'm a crazy person, Hmm. which in a weird way that kind of happens no matter what, you know. Um, But like, you know, like I think I realized along the way too. like, even if it is so, so what, dude, like if you have a disability, you get help with it or like, you know, there's adversity, but there's almost nothing in life that you can't overcome some way there's always some way to go through it i want to clarify my statement after you started talking i wanted to clarify that i'm saying that the 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 experience or schizophrenia itself seems to be bad but to have schizophrenia does not make you a bad person right yeah okay just just so we're clear he's not disparaging yeah no yeah schizophrenia uh, you know but um yeah no i mean i wouldn't I would hope that everybody in life is well adjusted, but like I don't think it's the case. I think we are all existing on this wide spectrum when it comes of thoughts and emotions and complex identities that don't fit in all the boxes that we have, and like we're in an interesting time period because like our generation is going to shed all that shit. It doesn't quite make sense anymore. Yeah, I um, sorry. No, no, you're, I, I've been struggling with this idea that I think you're kind of leading into of. How good is overcoming trauma? Like, uh, like, is it worth it to do it? Because I think, fuck yeah, it is. I've I've been having a. It was it was part of it was when we were talking to Paul Masurlian about yeah. it. Um, I remember so when I talk to people who have this mentality of like, no, you go through those things, you overcome them, makes you stronger, and it's good. And then I've talked to people who are are like, no, I feel as though you are not recognizing, acknowledging just how bad all this stuff is and it needs to stop. And I'm trying to find that balance of it, I guess. Because, for instance, uh, we'll use racism. Racism is bad. Me Mm -hmm. overcoming things personally through racism does make me a better person. It makes me grow, all that stuff. But it's still bad that it exists and it needs to be fucking stopped. But there's this... thousand percent. Yeah, there's this weird teeter-totter going on where there's this victim complex where it lets you completely, it just drags you to the bottom of the ocean and you can't get out of it. But then there's also this um, toxic positivity complex where you're now saying, no, no, racism's good because people have to overcome it. I love that there's a word oh, for that now. Toxic, toxic positivity. positivity. Like yeah. I, it's, it's like funny. that smell that you knew was there, you didn't know what it was. And then it came out like, oh, that's perfect. Yeah, well, it gets on my nerves. <laughs> I'm going to say this uh, 100% unequivocally, like racism is non-negotiable to me. It's, no. yeah, it's a very black and white issue. It's bad. Definitely black and white issue. I, I agree. Ayo. Yeah. Ooh. Ayo. Got the dad but jokes yeah, no. for days, son. <laughs> uh, I don't think there is any positive aspects to racism and um Wait, have I been toxically positive this whole time? No, no, <laughs> like, no. You, I'm toxic, like, wait a no, minute, hold no. on. <laughs> I don't know, um, unless, unless you're deep cutting us, and it's like so, so sublime that we can't right, even sense yeah. it. No, Bro. I don't. I don't think so. It's a very it's like elaborate setup that I'm going to twist right at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It feels more like you've accepted and acknowledged traumas and problems and inner issues, and yeah. you are now either working. I think you're always working, so I'll just say working through those things and learning how to cope. 
That's what I would describe it as. I wouldn't describe it as, no, this was all good that it happened to me, that my dad did whatever. Yeah. Uh, I think that's different. Yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, and unfortunately, the, you can't do anything about avoiding those circumstances. Yeah. That's just inevitable with the world that was already here. And we have to roll through the punches of like the old infrastructure until it's tossed out. Will it be? I don't know. And I, unfortunately, <laughs> um, I'll admit like this whole election felt like kind of a push. I'm glad we avoided like any Im- imminent immediate danger, hopefully. Yeah. But uh, for context, for when this comes out, yeah. we today we realized that Biden one i don't even want to say seems because now it's he won he won he's he's mathematically he was the winner okay cool he should be president something about sharpies people by every metric i think he was victorious in said election yes so god damn was it close and damn is that scary yeah yeah like i wrote a tweet about it like it's like i woke up and i found out half the fucking country likes their cereal with water (laughs) it's like wow so what do you think, let's say Trump won, hypothetical yeah. alternate universe, he won for another four years, what do you think would have happened and what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> I don't know. You yeah. have all the answers, right? Danny. <laughs> That's why we brought you on this yeah. podcast. Um, to, to it would have quell... been into the Badlands and part of me is into that. Right, yeah. I mean, I'd like to think that we can recover uh, – our nation's sanity and hopefully start to build a better tomorrow. But the reality kind of felt like too, that we're bringing back kind of the same old players to right. and going back to like, okay, this isn't perfect, but it's not like as bad as bad. <laughs> and it's not everyday chaos. It's occasional chaos that we mostly don't hear about, but it's not as in your face. Um, yeah. But does it get rid of it? I don't, you know, like, Dave Chappelle would not be as successful as he is now if uh, there wasn't some truth to the racial narratives and things that he was talking about when, you know, during a time that, like, on paper, we were cured of racism. Mm, You know? On paper. Yeah, that got on my fucking uh, nerves. But you and I, no, yeah, and, like, like I've said, I I feel weird sometimes because, like, sometimes people mistake me for white. Sometimes people very vocally let me know that I'm Mexican. (laughs) Um, but I, I just kind of keep quiet and just do my thing. But, uh, yeah, it's a weird time to be alive because you don't know where anybody quite stands, but half of them <laughs> are apparently racist as fuck. It's wild, man. And like, I don't know. Um, that thing though, you were just brought up about people either getting really aggressive with you as Mexican or white or whatever. How does that uh, yeah. affect your own personal identity? I mean, I don't know that I identify completely with any identity any like racial background it's weird to say um like the idea of racial identity is always interested me because like i feel like i've been brought up around a lot of different cultures and i've adopted different aspects of it i guess Mm. you know like even growing up like uh like i grew up in artesia california which is like little india at the time because there was so many like uh indian shops like india india you know um dot forehead not like yeah. sniper <laughs> India, you. sniper India, not Eagle yeah. India. There you go. Thank you. Um, <laughs> sniper India sounds so cool. But the, yeah, so like the I fact was that always... we even have to clarify <laughs> yeah. that. Anyway, though, thank you, Columbus. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, though, um, and like I always grew up around different cultures too. Like my first grade teacher was from Africa. My first like best friends were in kindergarten were Manabu and Joseph. Joseph. I'm sorry, was black. Manabu. Manabu is Japanese and like Mexican. That's a and name. Yeah, Manabu and Takeshi. Um, that yeah, those were like my best friends in kindergarten. Them and Joseph. So you have and a like. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just say it was Joseph. like in ghetto ass bellflower, with like a mixture of all kinds of people. Um, you know, and then I remember writing letters to my friend Shannon Smith on a typewriter when I was younger, and yeah, like I didn't even think about racism honestly until I remember. Um, probably to like move to the Inland Empire. That makes sense. Yeah, and then I was like, oh shit, <laughs> like I'm a wetback. <laughs> like, <laughs> so you have a real layered perspective here. Like you've had a lot of diversity throughout yeah. your life. Like my cousin, who's like my little sister's half black. Uh, my uncle Sean's always been around. He's black, and I never thought that was anything different. Um, 
but then you're, you know, we've even had experiences as a family where it's like, oh shit, these people are definitely hating on us. And like, mm. like in the very racial sense, these people are hating on us. The and Johnson's like, across the street fucking hate us. Yeah. Not nah, luckily, like all of the neighborhoods I've lived in have been very diverse too. Um, but I've definitely encountered people, like I said, in the Yellow Empire, especially uh, that were racist as fuck. Yeah. And like, is it weird that like the hood is safer? That like, yeah, yeah, it's weird that you feel more comfortable. Yeah. It's in like I, areas. it's predictable here. I know what's gonna go on. Yeah. Like, but in yeah. white races, you're like, Dude, I don't know what the fuck you are. Like, you're I like remember ninjas. being like, I remember being like 11 years old and being chased by skinheads in Corona, and it was like me and like my friends that were like Filipino. And this guy in a fucking Volkswagen bug yelling through an intercom that we were, get out of here, you wetback motherfuckers. We had an intercom on his car? He had an intercom on his uh. vo- green palm olive green Volkswagen bug. And he was yelling shit at us. The thing about like the hood or, uh. or, or places of color is like if keep your head down, stay away from people, and you'll be left alone. I think I even said that in the last yeah. podcast of like, the problem with these types of people, uh, the white racist people, is they don't leave you alone. My, f- I remember I had an art teacher once that described it perfectly, or kind of perfectly. Uh, Gabe Mejia, he's a teacher out in Chicago now, he went back to where he's from, but he was teaching out here in the Inland Empire for a while, and he broke it down for us that in the inner cities in bigger cities in general, apparently there are so many issues that people don't go seeking them. Mm. But when you have this stability imagine stability and don't have a lot to do, you're very vocal when somebody disrupts your perfect paradise, you know, and like people create their own issues. That makes sense. Actually. Um, yeah, I don't know how valid it is to every situation, but just think about that. I have another question for you, Dan, please. Uh, what Hills are you ideology? Ideological? Yeah. Ideologically. Ooh. Ideologically. What ide- adverbs up in this bitch? <laughs> what I- ideological hills are you willing to die on? What I mean by that is there's so many things going on. Racism is not cool. Okay. Racism. Yeah. Uh, and not acceptable. Let's never go back to where we were. Okay. So no racism cr- is. Yeah. That's a non negotiable. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Trump. When did you, you can fuck off? <laughs> when did you decide that like this is the hill? Oh, a long time ago, I'm mm. sure. Uh, like I've thought about race. I think, like I said, since uh, I first encountered issues, because I remember too, like being ostracized by like certain family members because, like, I guess they didn't think that we were Mexican enough, or so we were like the white family. But then at the same time, you're getting hate from the white kids that say you're clearly Mexican. Uh, I know the feeling. So it was like, what do you exist in? Art. <laughs> so like when, okay, so like let's yeah. go use the Trump thing. Um, I had a, if you can call it a discussion with a Trumpy person. And before. if you like Trump, like you're not a bad person, you're just confused. That was, you Aww, might be a bad that's person. That's cute. Yeah, it's very you nice. Might be bad. <laughs> yeah. Let's be honest. It's like you have to talk to them like they're kindergartners, yeah. but. Don't shoot me. God damn. <laughs> uh, kindergartners with guns, yeah. but. I was talking with a Trump dude, and, and I was talking about racism and all this stuff. And he yeah. was saying, um, you remember the Charlottesville march? Yeah. There's good people on both sides. And his thing that was, I know, yeah. but his thing was, well, he's saying there's good people on both sides, therefore, yada, yada, yada. I don't know how to put into words for something like that, if someone like that. Because when you say, no, it's a feeling, it's a vibe, it's understanding intuition, you can't use that with these people because they don't get it. How do you word that to them so that they understand? And they probably won't, but so they understand like this, this is nuanced and you're not seeing I it. think that's a form of toxic positivity, though, in that thing. You know, he's like, he's saying there's good sides, so he likes good people. You know, how's that being negative against other people? It's like, no, 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 you're taking it a little far. Right. You're not looking at the nuances. Yes, a Klansman can also be a father that like, <laughs> leaves a productive PTA life. Yeah. But he's a Klansman. And that is a not negotiable. Um, but yeah, I mean, how do you break that down to somebody that's like a Trump person, like that's a racist? Like, how do you explain to them that their racism is wrong? I don't know. If well, in, in my experience, their wiring's fucked up. I know, but in my, fix it. <laughs> in my experience on the street, in particular, no. they there's a lot of them that don't 
understand. Like they have South Park. I'll use South Park as yeah. an example. Um, do you remember the episode, the fish sticks episode? Yeah. Okay. Remember when Cartman, the, the joke first gets made and Cartman yeah. has his Im- imaginary idea of it. And then as the episode goes on, it becomes crazier and crazier and more extravagant to the point where he's fighting off dragons and shit yeah. to make the joke happen. How do you, is it even possible to reel that back in or is this country done? Oh, dude, I think you can always reel things back in. And like people, like there's this concept called neuroplasticity. Uh, and it's the idea that like your brain can be changed. And um, a big study that has proven this concept might have some substance to it was examining these Tibetan monks and how um, they literally changed their brain chemistry and like the way their brain was working through days and days of constant meditation. Um, I think that we're always in this fluid, uh, pliable state. And like even the hardest headed people, I firmly believe uh, like if you sit down and have conversations with them one to one, that's the way you solve racism. I don't know if you can do it or on a waterboard. Scale. <laughs> or a waterboard. No, um, but you know, I mean, like, there's this guy. What's his name? He's the. Do you go on the Rogan podcast and he talked to all the Klansmen? Yeah, yeah. You know who I'm talking I fucking about. know who you're talking. Daryl Wilson Knight? or some shit like that. I'll look him up. Or, yeah, Daryl Wilson. I don't know sounds what you're familiar. talking about. This guy <laughs> is the biggest badass in the yeah, he's world. Fucking crazy. This guy is a black man that went face to face with dozens, at least. I don't want to say hundreds, but at least dozens of uh, Klansmen. And had face-to-face conversations with them, got them to hang up the robes and give him the robes. So he has a collection of these Daryl Davis. There you go. Reformed Klansmen's hoods. And like I think that's how you solve any sort of conflict. Damn, he's like philosophical jujitsu. He's just taking people's belts. Like, you're done with that now. It's yeah. mine. It's crazy. <laughs> he's he did the Rogan podcast. It's a really good one. Interesting. There's interesting What's uh, his documentaries name? Uh, on Daryl Davis. Too. Okay. I'll send it to you later. But yeah. speaking of well, I don't know. I don't even know if I want to get into it. Ro- Ro- Please. Rogan is frustrating me right now, so yeah. I don't know if I want to get into it. <laughs> you talk about him like it's a close friend. Yeah. You know when you listen to, a, and you don't know them personally, but you listen to them so much that you feel like you, yeah. and I know I know, I don't know the guy, obviously, and he doesn't definitely doesn't know who the fuck I am. But you feel a little let down that he's probably appealing to the... It's he, I support freedom of speech. Yeah. You could say what you want, all the stuff that I need to say. Um, but it's starting to get frustrating. I, he I has so. in that when he talks, I understand he wants to make sure there's balance and that conservative people have a voice. Right. And I respect that. But now it's starting to get f- concerning because of, his huge fan base yeah who don't take into consideration like this is just a comedian this is just a guy he's not an analyst he's yeah. he's not educated in that way at all he's just a guy talking rogan understands that and i respect that he understands that but uh, i would it, it feels like a good deal of his people that really watch him that are diehards don't get that that like he's just he's just the guy calm down <laughs> Right, they're very dogmatic about it, and they're yeah. willing to die on a hill about shit. Where he's constant, like people don't realize, like that guy has a very rich history of being a liberal. Yeah, you know? and like this switch, if some may say he's just catering to the people that love him, but and you know, can you fault him for that? Well, I don't you even know? think he's doing that. I think he's just being himself because yeah, he he's just thinking out loud a lot of times. Yeah, yeah, he's just being himself. It's not, you know, what it is. Yeah. It's not him. Like, I just disagree with where he seems to be leaning right now. Yeah. It's not him. It's that we're in a place where where um, we deify people with podcasts yeah. because we're just taking them in all the time. I've Bill Burr is my surrogate dad at mm-hmm. this point. <laughs> yeah. I listen to Bill Burr advice compilations like I'm sitting down with him and he's just like, listen, son, here's what you got to do in life. And I, I just happen to have the self awareness to understand, like, no, Bill Burr's not my fucking dad. But it seems like a good people, a good deal of people in this country do not have it, that self awareness is either eroded or it just wasn't there, and now it's out in the open. The end. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, dogmatic is the perfect way to to say it at this point because 
You know, he is just a comic. Just like, like, <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> but that's the thing, though. Yeah, because like, he doesn't have like any set way of thinking. Yeah. So like anybody that treats him like he does is like that's their own. Where is that mental l- illness? I guess. Where is that line between the responsibility of the artist and what you put out there, and then people taking it in? Because I'm starting as I get older. I mean, he is a pioneer in that. Like no one has ever built on their own an audience this big and had this much influence like uh i i hate to say it but like election night i kept tuning into joe rogan's podcast into the world podcast just to see where things were yeah Yeah. and like i uh if 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 joe rogan were to roll and like a check for luck he'd roll a 20 for sure like he just (laughs) got softball pitch after softball pitch and now it's like jesus christ dude Maybe we should be using this responsibly. He has some crazy, like, think about crazy. Did you watch the Kanye? Oh, episode? I couldn't. Get, I watched a, like f- f- seven minutes, and I was like, "What are you? What is going on?" Yeah. And then he, I know he was saying like, um, but I think you're misunderstood, Kanye. You just don't. You just are thinking on a different level. It's like, no, no, no. This motherfucker needs medication. He does, but he's not as crazy as I thought. Too. You he were able to listen to all that shit? I was. God damn. Good. I make it a mission now, dude. He was a nurse. He's got a lot of compassion for people. <laughs> yeah, I've had to listen to crazy fucking people That's sometimes. Fair. But he's I I look, I he's not Kanye's not a bad person. Yeah. It's just does he need to be the president? Does he need to no. be running for election? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. And uh but like is he a visionary? Yeah. In his mind, for sure, and hmm. undeniably, he is. Yeah. He's, he's uh, an amazing artist. Artist, mm-hmm. yeah. For there is really no better term, right? Yeah. But the, I think the problem is that now artists are becoming the politicians. Is it now though? I mean, look at Ronald Reagan. I'll rephrase. It's becoming more ramped up. Yeah. It, the, in, the line between entertainment and an entertainer and a politician is so blurred now. Yeah, and that's kind of like we fucked ourselves a lot. I mean, but that's not the new either. Because think of it, Jesse the Body Ventura. Uh, Jesse Arnold the Sh- Body Ventura. Dude, I love <laughs> Will Sasser's <laughs> impersonation. He looks like him. he's going to die. He does. <laughs> Lives in Mexico. He's like, I was once a Navy SEAL. When? 1903, bro? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Tales from the Crypt here. I'm sorry. No, it's not good. What, what were you saying, dude? Um, <laughs> he lives in Mexico, living a life. No, um, oh, fuck. All I can think of is Jesse the Body. Even, oh, yeah, it's nothing new. Ronald Reagan, like, yeah. I mean, there, I there think, have been accusations for years that, like, the CIA and entertainers go hand in hand at certain levels, but who knows? Uh, yeah, I guess now it's just ramped up because of social media. Now yeah, it's like. Yeah. It's more transparent. Maybe? Yeah, it's turned up to 11. Um, yeah. and it's it's fucking weird. I tell people I'm on Do you the like Spinal sh- Tap by the way. Um, yeah. I I haven't seen it. I know the Turn Up to Eleven part. Yeah, but I, I've never actually seen Spinal Tap. Great movie. I believe it. Go on. Um, <laughs> I like mockumentaries. Me too. Mockumentary when they d- have you seen American Vandal? No. Fuck. Oh, yo. Fuck We're, politics. This yeah. is this <laughs> yeah, is what's yeah. important Let's get here. Get back to what's really important. American Art. Vandal <laughs> is, and I, you'll know that it's a mockumentary because of the context now. But yeah. I didn't know it was a mockumentary when it first. When I first started watching it for the first episode, I was like, "Is this real?" They were so like nuanced. It's about uh, there's two seasons. It's about the first one's about a. Um, it's a mystery of who drew dicks on the school uh, on all of the the teachers' cars in the parking lot. And it's like a good 10 episodes long, I think an hour each. It's brilliant. Please, George, please watch it. American it's a, Vandal. American Vandal season okay. one and two. Fucking phenomenal. All right. Yeah. So good. Like, does that on Netflix? Yeah, yeah. Okay, then I think that might already be in my queue. You hey, know, so. probably one of my favorite mockumentaries of all time is Paranormal Trailer. Activity. Ooh. Um, no. uh, oh, finding Guff, Waiting for Guffman. That was funny. Mm. Really good. I Yeah, but no. Best in show. <laughs> also a great... God damn it. All right. And I definitely grew up on those. I'm going to shut up and let you answer. No, I, yeah, this is just setting me up to say Trailer Park Boys. I love that show. Is that a mockumentary style? Yeah, I've technically. Uh, it's technically this extended documentary about the trailer park that never really ended. I have so much respect for those guys and like the business model and like what I, they've done. I don't know anything about it. You have to learn me. Let me break it down for you. It's brilliantly stupid. Um, (laughs) And it appeals to a trashy side of me that, like, 
I, I don't share to everybody, you know, like the kind that likes chili dogs and corn dogs and mini bikes and bush light. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like these guys, three guys, uh, and I think it was originally based on a short that the main guy that plays arguably the stupidest guy, Ricky, wrote about a guy in Nova Scotia that collects carts and sells them. He's this total scumbag guy. And this became the groundwork for what would later become the mockumentary about three dudes living in a trailer park in Canada. And um, I think this went on to be like a short series on Showcase in Canada. Then it became a huge hit out here when Netflix started distributing it. Um, I've like watched it from its inception, which is crazy because my roommates used to be super into it. And uh, it's crazy. It's gone on for 20 years. They've got different uh, movies. Uh, the premise of every single season was basically this. These guys got out of jail, and that's where the whole series started. Uh, and they want to get rich quick, and it's usually a weed-centric scheme where they're typically trying to grow or steal or do something with weed where they're going to get rich quick. And then at the end of the season, they always go to jail. And then there's been a couple movies that start off there when they're going to jail. How? They have a... 20 years? 20 years. They have a, an app coming out in December. They have a website where they teach, like, guitar lessons, have... All different, like this is something you should really look at. Look at SwearNet, because this is where the buddy system could go. SwearNet, you pay like five ninety nine, and there's different tiers. This was before no, nope, we're not. No one's gonna give the buddy system money for anything. <laughs> so. Just there saying. It goes. <laughs> Just saying. But yeah, like so, there's different tiers to get on their like, and this was before Patreon on their SwearNet thing. Then you have access to all their content, where in character they've put together these different shows, like. Bubbles is this guy that collects carts. He's kind of slow. He's their best friend. He resells said uh, shopping carts for like 23 bucks. Lives in a shed. He's obsessed with cats. Ricky is brilliantly stupid. There's so much how, to say. I'm sorry. No, no. Like, Nerding out. How, did, how does that, that concept get stretched for 20 years and not get old? Exactly. Okay. It, I mean, it got a little old, admittedly, toward later seasons, and they started having like really fun but ridiculous celebrity cameos. Like, there's a couple episodes of Snoop Dogg. They had the lead singer of Rush, where they kidnapped him. Uh, really obscure, or not obscure people, but maybe obscure to us. Sebastian Bach from uh, what was it? Uh, Warrant. Skid Row. Uh, the lead singer of this 80s metal band was on it. All these weird Willie Nelson. They also had like a European road show where they went on the road in Europe in character. These guys are brilliant. Um, but they, for years too, only gave interviews in character. And uh, yeah, you really got to look into this. I think you clearly, that. yeah, man, this is it's a whole legacy. And they've basically gotten away with being themselves and doing whatever they want. And they are millionaires now, I'm sure. Sounds like being comics. Yeah. Well, they are comics. It's just in a different form. Is that, do you feel like that's getting away with something? If you become a successful comic, which is essentially making money, being yourself, and fucking around, is that getting away with something, or did you put in work? I guess you put in work because you had to be so bold to envision that being an option in the first place. Most people don't realize that, like, you can just quit your job and roll the dice and try things out. You can. Yeah, you know, we we realize it kind of because we've uh, come this far and seen other people do it and yeah. continue to move on. But I think that's the thing. Sometimes it feels like we're like almost wrong, like getting like making yeah. money off of comedy feels wrong sometimes. Like you trick somebody. When yeah. They give like, you like a 20 or anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There have been times where I'm yeah. like, why the fuck is the it, and I know part of it is while it's I'm a working. Brilliant that's, scheme, yeah. yeah, well, yeah, and it's I not. I just shared how I really feel about you, and somehow you gave me twenty bucks. <laughs> it's fascinating because because part of me is like it's a scam, and the other part of me is like, no, this yeah. is art. Where is that line? I don't know. I don't know, man. Like, I don't know. I mean, you know, your skills as a stand-up. You know, like we could be really good podcasters, animators, all this other stuff outside of. Uh, you know, outside of comedy, and that's great. Um, 
but with stand up in particular, like you know where your chops are, and you're either funny or you're not, and you're either, you know, getting a lot of laughs or you're not. And uh, even though it's not always the most consistent, like I think that's your barometer for like how you're doing as a stand up artist. You know, the rest of it is kind of up to you to build this life that you, allows you to do it, I guess, until you make money. I th- but I think you and I have both talked about it. And I was like, uh, we're just going to keep going until we're good at it. Right, right. That's I think the goal. That's right? George's mentality as well. Good. Um, yeah, like, it's not a, you're not going to stop. Even if you get, like, 20 bucks from it indefinitely, like, yeah. you're going to get really good at that. That's your goal. Yeah. I, I think I'm personally just having a weird view of it because of what yeah. I'm doing on my on my own little side adventures. But um, I don't yeah. know if I feel like it's getting away with it, though. I mean, maybe because we're all kind of at different points, and by yeah. by the time you you know you get six, seven years in, it, I'll say this: I'm still very much in the red, and will likely <laughs> be in the red comedy wise for many years to come. Uh, it's gonna be. A lot of work to get out of the red, but I have no regrets about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I would say I appreciate when I get paid for it. Yeah, because I know the work that went in. I know that it, it it's easy and I can excel at it, but it's also hard, and not everyone can do it. So I understand it. You know, as a craft, it's like yeah, I I put in my time. Thank you for the twenty dollars, but what I did's going to mean more to me at the end of the day than the $20 you give me. Exactly. Or X amount that you give me. Granted, I've never been paid $80,000 for a special or anything, (laughs) but like I bet for most comics, the best part about doing the special is doing the special and not necessarily getting paid for it. I think those are the good comics. I hope so. I mean, but then there are comics that got away with it and you're like, man, how the fuck did they give you money for this (laughs) shit? Also, the journey in between the shows is worth it enough, you know, or between the milestones, I should say. Mm. Like, there's something fun to look back and say, like, you've got all these experiences. Yeah, 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 for sure. Like, my my, my professor, I'm in a photography class right now, and he, yeah. he pushed us to just start, hey, man, just start printing your pictures because you can give that to someone. You can hand that down. You, that can go on, and then they can live in your memories as well. And it's like, yeah. oh, I never thought about it. See, I admire that you're going back and like studying shit that you actually enjoy and give a shit about. I'm just bored. Um, still, though, that's a good <laughs> use of time, man. Like, George is a fascinating creature. I like, again, going back to the fear thing, I think I used to be afraid to kind of embrace like the creative side of myself fully because I was always kind of taught that like it wasn't, like I come from people that had no idea how to be creative or yeah. turn that into Don't talk life. about Aaron's family like that. <laughs> yeah. My family's right. You're, you're, you're totally right. My family is the most uncreative. Uh, newsflash, we are brothers if you're following the logic yeah, right, of this that is sentence. A... <laughs> no, no, um, but yeah, no. Um, yeah, I was like afraid to be creative and now like I realize, oh, you're free to take classes in whatever you want. You really can study whatever you want. What is that? That um, You don't that... have to be a lawyer. <laughs> right. <laughs> this, this, this idea of everyone stand in line and do what you need. Like, it... it I think a good deal. I think maybe we'll relate here. I'm not sure with George, but George is a weirdo. Okay, go on, Aaron. Yes, Sorry. Um, <laughs> just kidding. He did magic. Anyone that does magic, I don't trust. Oh, you gotta distrust me then too, because oh, magic was a huge fuck. Part of Are you guys growing. both? Did you guys both do magic? Yeah. Can, can you guys blow my mind, little, please? Hey, you want me to show me your French drop? Or that sounds a, dirty, dude. I thought I was just gonna do this shit. Like, oh like, shit! Wait, wait, a French <laughs> drop. Yeah, French drop is. Oh, don't, like, don't tell me the secret. I just want to see it and blow my mind. Do you have like a small object, maybe? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can <laughs> That's do low this. hanging fruit. I'm not even. <laughs> yeah. uh, does it need to be round or like a card? Does this not um, work? Here, I'll use the cap, I guess. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I can do magic anymore, though. But yeah, first uh, book report I ever did was on Harry Houdini, and I definitely was like amazed by magic growing up. The, this is to, apparently one of the oldest tricks ever. Okay, get, I and need to like stand up like and walk around if thieves. it's good. Okay, you need to stand up and walk around. That's how I react to all magic if it's good. Because he's not gonna black. Be that good. Yeah. There is so much hype in here. There's no way. <laughs> <gonna live> <laughs> all right. Yeah, dude. I don't know. Like, oh, that wait. Guy. Fuck you. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. There's no way in hell I'm gonna live up to that. Okay. Um, so sleight of hand. Sleight of hand, but okay. also, if you have a deck of cards, I can do probably like I 
got at least six memorized, mm. probably offhand. Hmm. Um, yeah, I used to be big on. I trick. feel like people that are into magic, they're all kind of the same person. They probably like. <laughs> They're, they like their hand. They, they work well with their hands. They don't work well f- often with other people. They're tinkerers, very introverted, very like, how does this work? How does that work? I wonder if I can make it work. And so there's a, there's an almost a borderline autism that every, every kind of magic person can kind of relate to with other magicians. So pe- like if you talk to David Blaine, he's weird as fuck. He seems pretty weird. For <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. So people that get into magic have a particular personality would you say it's similar or very very different to a comedian similar in the sense of like people that are into magic like thinking <laughs> become like they're good bartenders they're because as a bartender you don't necessarily have to re interact with people hmm. you just kind of have to do your job exist you can kind of pop in and out and they're also good at like solo ventures is is what those kinds of people excel in or when they're like borderline egotistical like they're the main character now in their story kind of mm. thing yeah it's a similar personality trait i would say and they tend to be into oddities and stuff like that right yeah. like open-minded um this is uh, f- before i freaked out about magic no, uh no. the the i think one of the reasons personally i was depressed was i i was just this type of person that i guess was it march to the beat of your own drum yeah offbeat mm-hmm. but i've never until this day i still don't understand it i don't understand Society, man. Like, I don't get society, brother. I don't understand this fucking, uh, this corporation, this this sit in a cubicle, this go, wake up, go to work, come home, yeah. eat food, go to sleep, wake up, go to work, and do that. I don't understand it, and it gives me anxiety even thinking about it. You ever read about the Beat Generation? No. Like, Kansas I don't, I don't read. And, no? No. Well, you might want to go on YouTube and just check out the Beat Generation. Um, look up maybe "On the Road" by Jack Kerouac. I feel like you would enjoy that period of American history, like poets and authors and artists dropping out of society, That's living on the road, and kind of rediscovering where they are in life because they don't agree with the country around them. But that look see, that, up. that is a <laughs> hundred, dude. That's my shit. Yeah. And look my, up "Howl." My thi- "Howl." Howl. It's Howl. a poem. Um, okay. It's kind of super outdated in its language now, but it'll give you an idea of like what the whole beat generation was. I love that shit. Yeah. My thing is, I don't understand why, and maybe oh, like this could be projecting, we'll see, but it feels as though society gets angry with those people. Like there's, there's this like, no, you have to be doing what we do. Or at least that's been my experience in my whole life is, no, 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 you need to... Come back here. Stop going over there. Come here behind the fence and act the way we need you to act. And I don't understand that. I don't understand if it, if a person wants to leave that fence, just let them fucking leave. And I yeah. don't I don't get the draw in. If you guys could explain that to me, be greatly appreciated. <laughs> I have Asperger's. You go, George. I think it's just <laughs> people. It's hard you know we're risk averse i'd say it's like it's a risk but we un- we think at least we we boil it down to understand but we think what's at the end of our journey is worth the risk and those people are like well you could just work at this job and climb a, a corporate ladder and but for some people that's enough you know so it's just it's risk aversion it's it's we have two hemispheres for our brains like some people think with the other side I look back on like my judgment choices that I've made and like and there's been periods of my time where like I by another person's barometer might appear like fucking out of my mind. You know, and some of the decisions that I've made and things I've done, but uh you look at you and say something important. I am. Go on. I understand that and I'm sure we all we are is viewed as we're out of our mind for doing this. And I understand and respect if someone wants to do what George just described of yeah. you go to work and then you retire. If you want to do that, that's fine. Yeah, My not. thing is the forcing other people in line or forcing me specifically in line. I don't understand that and it I don't like it. But I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand like if someone is expressing like I just don't want to do this thing that everyone else is doing. Just, I'm not hurting anybody. Let me go over here mm-hmm. and do my stupid shit that you think is not interesting or whatever, or it's crazy. Freedom, yeah, for his <laughs> fucking freedom ain't free. Yeah. Um, um, but 
I yeah. don't understand the Put mentality. <laughs> Uh, I don't understand the mentality of trying to drag those people back. To what, like into society? Has somebody yeah. tried to drag you back into society? In my whole life has been people trying to keep me into society. Nobody's come looking for me, dude. So. I'm <laughs> fucking <laughs> jealous. <laughs> I I think that's where yeah. this anger comes from racially and, and all this stuff is like me, my entire life, always being like, no, I want to do all these other things. And for whatever reason... This in the particular situation I was in, we wouldn't let me do that, and I still to this day don't understand that. Well, just realize that ultimately you have the freedom over your own life to an extent. Um, and like the only thing that really matters is like the world inside of us, you know, like is crazy as the external world gets, as long as you have a pretty good control over like your internal and immediate circumstances. Like that's your world, man. Fuck. Yeah. Fuck what the rest of the country's doing. If Change you your number, go, bro. Don't let them know. Yeah. <laughs> I I agree, and I'm in that space now, and I'm thinking more about because I mean, I've yeah. been working with children too, and I've been seeing a lot of this shit yeah. from an adult perspective. I'm thinking in children who don't have that autonomy. They don't have the ability or the mental capacity to be like, "Well, I'm just gonna be free, be free, do what whatever." I yeah. Do. Just, yeah. Well, I don't, other people's opinions don't matter, even though I'm 13 and I'm in middle school, like. Dude, I'm like 33 and barely really getting a grasp <laughs> on that. It's hard. Yeah. And I think a big part of why it's hard is because society pushes people like that down. And I just don't get it. So maybe I'm just going, I'm going in circles. It's the man, bro. It's the, fu- it's the fucking man. It's the government, bro. It's big brother. Doesn't want you to succeed. You know, it's, I think it's just people are afraid. And yeah. our society has not taught us how to deal with fear. Mm. Yeah, it really hasn't. Uh and again, I think that's where people just do what they feel instinctually is the right thing. Run. You know, and then like that just results in people not self-actualizing and not being the happiest versions of themselves because they haven't given themselves a chance to be. And then who knows what issues ripple off that. <laughs> Racism. Yeah. Uh, stupid bullshit like that. <laughs> oh. Yeah, dude. Um going back to magic oh uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> the fun stuff yeah i know um so you were never really into magic though at all i remember watching the mass magician yeah uh and being like whoa elephant that was behind the, yeah, yeah that guy no. uh did do magicians hate that guy i yeah. enjoyed it i liked being like oh that's too. how we fucking did it that's cool as fuck that seems like a lot of work though i'm i enjoy more like david blaine stuff of yeah. what seems impromptu not necessarily you know just right there in your face even though most of us not, but like I, that stage magic is cool. But for me, it's like, I, I understand there's a lot that I don't get to see even with the stage. I kind of like the street stuff too. And like mm. the impromptu stuff and card tricks and like, like I have a whole book on, uh, what is it called? Uh, David Copperfield, by the way, it's hilarious. I think he yeah. seeing him live is what might've pushed me to do comedy in, instead of just magic. Cause my favorite part about magic is every mad magician I met was kind of funny. You know, yeah. it's same set, and it's the same thing you're doing. So I wanted the to do that. Amazing Jonathan is great. Yeah, dude. yeah, but well, then I was like, that's too. a lot of work to have a magic trick. Yeah, just be funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I um, I love. Wait, have you seen the documentary about him? Yeah, that yeah. was a really good documentary. Man. Which one? The, the one by Steve Byrne. What year did it come out? The, the first one. The yeah. the one that makes him look good, or the one that's real? Uh, the one that's real. The one that, that makes him look about. good. I enjoyed it. What's up? The one that talks about him and the kid in Vegas that like and his like super dark personality and how he was into speed and yeah, I think that's the one I've seen. I watched the one where it's really confusing. I don't know which one came out first. Yeah, I watched the one where he took it over eventually because he didn't like how they were portraying him, and then I watched the one the good one the good well, the one the where, one where the, he was good. The real one? The real, the, how fucking, whatever. How yeah, I was going to look it up, but I didn't know it's how like to the like. like Wild World or something. What was his name again? Uh, uh, Amazing, Amazing Jonathan. Jonathan. Amazing Jonathan, yeah. yeah. The one I'm talking about was directed by Steve Byrne, and I randomly won an autograph poster. Nice. Because I have an autograph book by the Amazing Jonathan that That's I got cool. when I was a kid. That's fucking dope. Yeah. I mean, I guess it comes down to like, do you, do you separate the art from the artist? Can you? Uh I didn't see him being that bad. If we're talking about the same documentary, he's a flawed person. Mm-hmm. I just, I guess, my perspective though. Here is it is. Okay, so this accepting. is the good one in my opinion, yeah, where it, yeah. it exposes kind of his personality, 
And then this was the one that I watched first. Never saw that one. So I saw the good one. <laughs> if you watch, the, he's it's very strange. Yeah. He he's clearly trying to make himself look good. It, it's it's. It's it's a whole thing, but regardless, magic I think is dope. I love magic. I love watching. I love freaking out yeah. with it. Um, it's fun. Like you know when people are like oh black dudes react to it because black because black dudes are fun. It's fun. <laughs> we know obviously is this isn't witchcraft. Like read that in a book once. No, <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. It's just fun. Yeah. It's it's uh, that's the thing that like I think it's just let yourself. Let yourself get invested and in, in, in immersed in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I know you're not a wizard, but it's so much fun to pretend like yeah. you just came out of the, the dust and you you just did. Also, some some tricks, you're like, this dude's a wizard. This yeah, dude's right. definitely a fucking this wizard. This shit is crazy. You remember Max Maven, the mind control shit? Like, no. What's there that? was a guy, Max Maven, that was like a pioneer in what's called mentalism. Oh, yeah. And it's like a lot of stuff that like appears like almost like clairvoyant or psychic abilities but really he's just like NLP. doing what's called a force mm -hmm. where it like gives you the illusion that you've got freedom of choice but you don't really and it's um uh, my can we stop talking about politics guys <laughs> <Fuck>. <laughs> my guy is darren brown darren brown he's the fucking shit darren brown is so dope yeah, yeah. i don't know if i he's a magician he's a magician mentalist performer he, yo he is yeah He's one of the best NLP users I've ever seen. And he... That's some game talk, right? Or uh, what is it? Um, oh, what's NLP? Uh, Neurolinguistic Programming. Right, which is championed in yeah, the game yeah. by Neil Strauss, right? Yep, it Negging is. Negging people. Negging right. and and implanting ideas and thoughts. Yeah. Like, it's I'm a manipulative piece of shit. Well, that's what I was going to say. I have a whole book on, I think it's called Theatrical Stage Magic, or Theatrical... Anyway, it's it's pickpocketing, theatrical pickpocketing. That's mm -hmm. what the book is. And it's like how to steal shit from people. And it's a whole book written on it. And then I've got a whole one on like hustling on the street. And it's like it's amazing that these things are recorded anywhere. Yeah. And I think <laughs> I think knowing about stuff like knowing yeah. about magic or knowing about how jokes work allows you to understand. I hope I do. I mean, you seem to. <laughs> you made a joke. You made a, a joke. You made a, um, a, a whole. I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. I'm losing my shit. Um. <laughs> So I have more shit I got to do after this, so I might have to leave soon. But yeah, okay. we're closing on two hours, so we can wrap it up soon. Okay. Are we really? Mm -hmm. It's been fun. Yeah. yeah Thanks yeah. for having me back. I I love these. I love the buddy cast. It's it chill fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jerk each other off for a yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'll I'll and what I say there. I love the buddy cast. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, answer my question though. I mean, are you guys the type of people to separate the art from the artist, or uh, do you yeah. think it's contextual? Do you does it depend or? <laughs> Yeah, depends. It, it depends, man. Like I don't want to sit. Like I don't want to paint myself in a corner. Like there's Nobody some people the out there the that you know have very questionable backgrounds that have undeniably put out some good work. I'll say that, and it sucks because it's that weird compromise. Like, do you enjoy this? I would say, is me consuming their art continuing to fuel their ability to hurt others? Right. If I'm do if if that's the situation, I I don't think it's appropriate to separate if artist is still technically connected to said art yeah then that's like if bill cosby well, that's fair had that's like, very fair i never thought about it like that like i don't think bill cosby gets royalties if i watch bill cosby himself on youtube yeah but you he, wouldn't go out to like the sleepy tour with bill cosby is that a thing no oh my god <laughs> but if it was would you go no oh, well okay. <laughs> well ugh. the sleepy tour featuring you'd go bill for the cosby. bit though wouldn't you kind there's that's the thing is with, with opener louis C. No. <laughs> you have to accept that you're also going to hell for a I second i know right <laughs> yeah. but no that, that's why i would make the distinction if i'm still fueling what they're doing that's bad then three I drinks do with it. all tickets oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry um it's like how i eventually i want to get uh some trump memorabilia because I think that might be worth some shit in the future. It's like World War II memorabilia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like getting a Nazi. So there's that old black dude that has a Trump flag. <laughs> Check out this hat. Uh, this is a time we couldn't wear red hats again. Right. But I, I don't want to go buy one because yeah. that would then feed into the bullshit. So I'm just going to steal it. Hmm. All right. Fair. Yeah. I like it. You Very nuanced perspective. <laughs> <laughs> um, any shows you guys got going on? Any any productions you want to announce? Anything you oh, want to drop? Dude. Any dates? Just working in secret. I mean, if uh, what did Lil Wayne say? Real G's move in silence like lasagna. Oh, I subscribe to that doing? philosophy. That's no. fair then. Well, where can they catch you guys? Instagram. 
Instagram at Danny Frank Comedy. Hey Danny Frank on Twitter, and uh, just check out my link tree from Instagram. Uh, I'll post some stuff up. I've got the podcast and some other ideas going. Kind of took a month off after I got laid off to just kind of like decompress. The fuck the man, dude. Yeah. You take a you month. I agree. That's kind of how I felt too, man. I was like, what am I doing in my life? Is this what I want to do? How do I make what I want? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, no, I was always going to say. <laughs> I ain't got uh, shit going on. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Aaron Chase 91 on Instagram and TikTok. And um, the street. Like, I'm just going to be on the street. You'll see me. <laughs> there you go. If you join want, his text list. Yeah, just join the fucking text list. If you want to know where Aaron's at, you got to ask the streets. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you guys for listening. I'm at the George F. If you guys want to check out more shit, go to www.thebuddysystem.co for everything. Thanks for listening. We'll see you later. Bye. <laughs>